round with the soup in half an hour, and I thought we should have to wait an hour. I never take it. It interrupts my work. Yes. Why do you work all the time? It's not what one comes out of pleasure for you, for, is it? Work is my only. Oh, that's no good sense, is it? It gives me the pip to see you always sitting there over your writing, never enjoying yourself, nor even taking a drop of soup. You should get up and have a game of deck with You feel ever so much better after it. I feel perfectly well, thank you. And I love deck games, especially deck quits. Slapping of those silly things on the deck always destroys the quiet of the Oh, I see. That is why you chose this end of the deck. I often wondered why. In the last fortnight, you have inspected the priceless antiquities of Naples, Athens, Egypt, and the Holy Land. Please occupy a mind there until the soup comes. I don't care much for geography. Where are we now? You're on the Red Sea. But it's blue. What did you expect? Well, I don't know what the colour of the sea might be in these parts. I always thought the Red Sea would be red. Where did it? And isn't the black sea black? It's precisely the colour of the sea of Margate. Oh, I'm so glad you know Margate. There's no place like it in the season, is there? I don't know. I've never been there. Oh, you ought to know. You could write a book about it. I wonder why they call it the Red Sea. Because their bars call it there. Why do you call America America? Well, because it's America. What else would you call it? Well, it's what you like, dear lady, but I have 500 words for every whole lot, and I cannot do that if I talk to you. Yes. It is annoying to be talking to someone all the time. Oh, that reminds me. I have something really interesting to tell you. I believe the man in the cabin next to mine beats his wife. I feel it like myself. Some women will prefer any man. Well, I will say this with him. She always begins it. No doubt. And I hate to nag her, don't you? It's your privilege as a woman to have the last word. Please use it and don't end all your sentences with a question. <laughs> you are funny. <laughs> Am I? I feel no less funny in my life. Yeah, I can't make it worse at all. I'm rather good at making up people out of all, but I can't seem to make heads or tail of you. I am not here to be made out. And you are not here to make people out. Never in the enjoyment you paid for. Deck tennis, deck quits, shuffleboard, golf, squash rackets, the swimming pool, the gymnasium. All the night. I'm no good at games. Besides, they're silly. I'd rather sit and talk. For heaven's sake, talk to somebody else. I have no time for talk. I have to work my passage. What do you mean, work your passage? You're not a sailor. No. I make a precarious living on board the ship I write in the Marco Polo series of chatty guy books. Thus, complete 2,000 words a day, I am bankrupt. I'll complete them if you persist in talking to me. Do you mean you're writing a book about this cruise? I'm trying to. The great authorities. Will I be in it? You will. Oh, I'm thrilling! I've never been booked a book before! You will read me what you've written about me, won't you? The book is published. You can read it to your heart's content. But I should like you to get me right. After all, what do you really know about me? I will tell you the whole of my life if you like. Please, heavens, no! Please don't! No. Oh, I don't care who knows it. Gently! You would hardly ought to tell to a perfect stranger if you cared. Or if it was of the smallest interest. Oh, I'd never think of you as a stranger. Besides, here we are on the same ship. And most people would think my life quite a romance. Wouldn't you really like to do it? No, I tell you. When I went for romances, I invented for myself. Well, perhaps you wouldn't think it very wonderful. But it was a regular treat for me. You may think that because I am well dressed and travelling the loops and all that, that I am an educated lady. But I am not. I never supposed for a moment that you were. Well, how did you know? How did you find out? I didn't find out. I knew. Who told you? Nobody told me. Then how did you know? How do I know that a parent isn't a bird of paradise? Well, they're different. Precisely. But, but what would you take me for if you met me at a third class camp? Not <laughs> oh, I bet you would. I may be beauty, but when I get into a railway carriage, every man thinks of me. Not every man. Every man thinks of every woman that steps into a railway carriage with the right one. She is always a disappointment. Same with the women, isn't it? You're a woman you know. I am a woman, and you are a man with a slight difference that doesn't matter except on special occasions. Oh, what a thing to say. I never could bring myself to believe that. I, of course, know that men have their weaknesses and their tempers. But all the same, there is something wonderful you can get from a man that you never get from a woman. Don't you think so? Inexperienced men.
men often think there is something wonderful that you can get from a woman that you can never get from a man. It's many unhappy men. Are you married? Oh, this is the first time you've asked me a question. We are getting on, aren't we? No, I'm not getting on with my woman. You're an intellectual, aren't you? You think you mean by an intellectual? Only that you consider me no better than an idiot. And perhaps you were a bad husband, most likely. You're quite right on both points. I thought so. Now, may I get on with my woman? Oh, please yourself. I'm not hindering you. Thank you. Ah. 
hard and miserable just because it's a change. When you do anything for a change for years, it's change all the time. And he begins to realize what it is to have a separate home and belong somewhere. Oh, I shall be sorry to be home from the shop and the telephone. I get such a dreadful stop here sometimes. Other times it seems such a terrible waste of money, and I hate wasting money. That is an extremely attractive point in your character. My wife used to waste my money. Stick to that and you'll get married in Oh, <laughs> I've had plenty of offers. <laughs> but you see, it's a terrible thing to be a poor man's wife and you've been accustomed to a clean, decent job. Now I've seen bright, jolly girls come into dirty old trenches to get you married. Don't be afraid of dirt. Mine is a clean job, but I've often tried a dirty one to exercise me and keep me in health. Set on clean collars that they, they make their sons clerks and they'd be stronger and earn more money as navvies. I'll punch out as a navvy instead of running guard books. Well, what's to prevent you? I have not trained for manual work. Half an hour of work made me wish myself dead. And five minutes of my work produced a strike among the navvies. No, I'm only a right to machine, just as the navvies have been. Well, I don't think the world is rightly arranged. Do you? We must take the world to be fine. It's we that are not our Well, that's what I mean. Well, I suppose I shouldn't interrupt your work. You mean that the steward is coming around to the soup at last? And it is half past eleven. Depends on the number of orders. Well, don't say to me again if you don't mind. It gets on my nerves. I used to get 
it on mine, but I'm used to it. You got the business. Sorry. There is a leaflet in the church written by our vicar. You are expected to put chocolates in the box for it. Oh, excuse me, but the chocolates are chocolates, sixpence, and a shilling. Which size would you write to? There's a poor heart that never rejoices. I'll have a shilling one. Oh, thanks very much. Don't. I can't help it. I say it without thinking. Same as if you touched a button. Someone touched the button. What number, please? White hole. One, two, one, two. Yes. That's police call. You don't want the information. You're not the criminal. Oh, it's not a criminal. Somebody that's been broadcasted on the wireless is lost. You know the sort of thing. Uh, missing from his home since January the 1st. Last seen on a deck chair in the Empress of Patagonia talking to a female, so big most memory. Oh, it's true. Excuse me. You are through to Whitehall. You have hit on an extraordinary coincidence. I wonder what you believe me when I tell you that in January last, I was at home with a little shipping of this category, and that I was talking to a female. Or rather, she was talking to me. Oh, how that woman did talk. Are oh, you suffering from loss of memory? Certainly not. I never forget anything. Oh, then it can't be you, Kent. There. Kent? That's been always been in the sense of Kent? Where is it? Isn't it? So that you have to answer her upon politeness. Take care never to pick up that habit, or you will be murdered some. Some people are like that. It often goes with brown colored eyes. Did you happen to notice the color of her eyes? No, I never notice things like that. I'm not a detective. It's people's characters that impress me. I, I can't tell you the color of her hair or the shape of her nose, but I can tell you that she was a most fearful nuisance. I'm sorry, Oh. Uh, the string bag, sixpence, chocolates, a uh, shilling, one and sixpence. The ginger beer. Show me the details. Ten shillings, Carlos. Oh, yes, of course. You shouldn't be so careless about money. See, so it's Take it and give me the change. Let me see. Uh, Eighteen pence and four pence for the ginger beer is one and ten pence, isn't it? How about an island? Cheese, three pence, two and a penny. Butter, six pence, two and seven pence. The apples, we sell by the pound. Let me but have a pound. I meant to have a pound. Three. Never more than twelve at a time. How would you charge me for the pound and hit the argument yourself? I'll say three pence for two, that's two and ten pence, isn't it? I don't know. Uh, Hobus, Toppins, halfpenny, three shillings and a halfpenny. Uh, do you have a halfpenny? You say if having to take fifth pence, halfpennies and coppers. No, I hate halfpennies. I always took them away. Stop yourself, I get mad. Thanks very much. Man, those men, the mother men. 
We don't consider it respectable here. Should I get any money with you? Do you own the shop? No. All the money I've had, I've nude on a trip round the world, but Mrs. Ward is getting too old for the business. She couldn't run it now without me. If you could afford to buy her an annuity, she'd sell it. I don't know how much annuities cost. You'll find it with his owner. This is rather upsetting. Somehow I've always taken it for granted that when I married again, I'd marry a woman with money. Oh, that wouldn't suit you at all. She'd want to spend it going into society, traveling about. How could you bear that sort of like you that never spoke to anyone on the ship and never took part in any of their games and dances? When it got about that you were the Marco Polo Club, the murder of all our dreams, as you might say, I made a bet that I'd get you to talk to me, and I had all the trouble in the world to win it. Do you mean to say that we have met before? That you were on that trip around the world? Oh, of course I do, but you never noticed anything. You were always reading or writing. The world doesn't exist for you. You never looked at me, really. You're shy with strangers, aren't you? I am absolutely certain I never talked to anyone on that ship. Whenever I talk to women, they always want to marry me. Well, there you are, you see. The moment I set eyes on you, I said to myself, now that's the sort of man that would suit me as a husband. Not on the first side, what? Oh, um, now you know, if I fell in love with a man, I could never marry him. He could make me so miserable, but there was something about you. I don't know what. It made me feel that I could do it in the house, and then I could fall in love with anyone I liked without any fear of making a fool of myself. I suppose it was because you were quiet sort and drove after women. How do you know I don't run after women? Well, if you must know, it's because you didn't run after me. You might not believe it, but men do run after me. Why? Oh, I don't know why. They don't know themselves. But the lot of money they spend on things they don't want, merely to come in and have a look at me and have a word with me, you wouldn't believe it. It's worth at least 20 pounds a year to the business. I should call you a pretty woman. No, I'm not pretty, but I'm what you might call desirable, don't you think? No, I, I, I don't think. May I explain? <clears throat> I am a man of letters and a gentleman. I'm accustomed to associate with ladies. That means that I'm accustomed to speak under certain well understood reserves, which act as a necessary protection in both parties. You are not a lady, you are a girl, Charlie. Somebody has educated you, probably the church, the local authority, to a point that you can impose on unobservant and unwary travellers. You have finishing lessons on the telephone, which gives you a distinguished articulation. You say, three, five, nine, instead of three, four, nine. But you have not applied any of the reserves. You, you speak what you think. You announce all the plans as well read women can see them. Play with your cards on the table and say, keep them where a lady should keep them. What do you mean you rushed? Rushed. Precipitated. Carried a lengths I had no intentions of going to. Well, it gets you somewhere, doesn't it? Yes. But where? Here! There's no mystery about it! Here in a good business, in a village shop, in a quiet place! Let me keep it straight and look after you! May I ask how much that expression, looking after me, includes? Let me be clear on the point. As a matter of fact, I possess a small property which I could sell for enough to purchase an annuity for old Mr. Williams. What? I believe I've got to purchase an annuity for both Mrs. Ward and Mrs. Williams, as they are presumably both centenarians. But why on earth should I complicate the transaction by marrying you? I can pay you present wages. Salary? I beg your pardon, salary. You can then retain your present position as my shop. Shop assistant? I beg your pardon, shop assistant. <laughs> you can then be free to make your own matrimonial arrangement. Oh, I'll make my own matrimonial arrangements. You may depend on that. Excuse me. I added, and leave me to make mine. Can I depend on you for that also? Well, we'll see. No, we will not see. Well, what? I don't know what. I will not commit myself. We will see. Just so. We'll see. It's a bargain then. No, it is most certainly not a bargain. I entered the shop half an hour ago. I had not the faintest notion. Buying a village shop or marrying a village maid or any of the things that you have put in my head. Have you ever read the fable of the spider and the fly? No. But I used to sing a song called The Honeysuckle and the Bee. Good morning! You are forgetting your things! Thank you. No! Yet. You've been at it for half an hour. Whatever on earth are you 
fled from South, where he did all that when he makes out the income tax return. You're not expected to do figures in the village. Hence the old Mrs. Ward doing such a thing. When I bought this shop from Mrs. Ward for an annuity, I found she was much cleverer at figures than I was. She should have been a money lender. Well, she was. She lent a shilling for a penny a week. That must have been between four and five hundred percent per annum. Charlotte would have blushed. Well, what's the good of it when you have to give credit at the shop and then lend the customers the money to pay you? Mrs. Ward had gone to Geneva. International finance would have suited her greatly. That's too clever for me. Anyhow, you needn't worry over a balance sheet. The accountant will do that for you. This is not an accountant's balance sheet. It's Robinson Crusoe balance sheet. Whatever's that? Crusoe drew a balance sheet of the advantages and disadvantages of being cast away on a desert island. I'm cast away in a village on the Wiltshire Downs. I'm drawing up a similar balance sheet. Refers to read you as far as I've got. You can remind me anything I've got. No, let's have it. I begin with the credit records. Things to your credit, you mean? No. To the credit of a village shop keeping us away of life. Oh, you are a silly boss. That is a disrespectful remark, and as such, it should not be made to a boss by his slave. The conditions on which I raised your salary when I engaged you as my assistant was that things would remain completely conventional in business like on your side. However, I might occasionally forget myself. Very well. You can keep your balance sheet. I will go on with the telephone call. You will do nothing of the sort. You will do what I tell you to do. Now, sit down again. This is nothing I pay you for. Listen. I, I have sharpened my faculties and greatly improved in understanding and mathematics. Couldn't you put it into shorter words? What does it mean? It means that formerly I always took what money was given me without condescending to count or attempting to calculate it. I can now both calculate and count quite rapidly. If formerly I always made no distinction between grains of butter and eggs. To me, an egg was an egg and butter was butter. I now make critical distinctions of the greatest subtlety, and I value them in terms of money. I'm forced to admit that the Marco Polo man is vastly inferior to the shopkeeper. That I've learned more than three months in this shop than three years of Oxford. I can't believe that about the learning. But see how your manners have improved? My manners? Yes. Well, in your leadership, you hired a word to throw to a dog. And if anyone came near you, you shrank up into yourself like a hedgehog, afraid that they didn't belong to your class and wanted to speak to you without an introduction. Now, it's a pleasure to hear you say, Good morning! And what could I do for you today, Mrs. Burrell? Have you noticed the cauliflowers today now? I'm not a touch of frost on them. And spare grass, very good today, my lady, if you would be wanting some. I positively deny that I have ever referred to asparagus as spare grass to an educated customer. Of course, when people are too ignorant to know the names of what they eat, that is another matter. Well, anyhow, your matters have improved, haven't they? I don't know. I know they are no longer disinterested and sincere. Never more than they used to be. Now, for well, ever the well meant. As you might say, with everybody. The world has become a world of customs. And you're at the time. Man's will never be universally good until every person is every other person's customer. You're not a real shopkeeper yet, boss. All you want is to find something clever to write. Why not? Find something clever things that should say, and you are a prime minister. Write them down, and you are a Shakespeare. Yes, but who wants to be a prime minister or a Shakespeare? You've got to make a living. Not making a living. I'm no more now than when I bought the shop. But if the money goes as fast as it comes, you can't save anything. Don't no, save. Turn to your nature, sir. Cast your bread upon the water, and it will return to you after many days. And how are you to live for the many days with nothing to eat? I don't know. What does somehow? Anyway, back to the balance sheet. I speak for your good. The most offensive liberty one person can take with another. What business is it of yours? If you will take for yourself, somebody else will for you. It's my business as much as yours. Oh, indeed. Who does this shop belong to? I mean, to whom does this shop belong? I make my living out of it, don't I? If it shuts up, what becomes of me? If that happens to you, what becomes of me? You can find another job. I very greatly doubt whether anyone would hire me. Can you not be satisfied with the fact that the shop is making enough to support two people? Suppose it had to support three people. Well, I suppose it has it, that's all. That's not all. If you marry a stranger, there will be three. And what of the children? Remedy is simple. I shall not marry. 
You don't know. Neither do you. Yes, I do. You have married once and you will marry twice. Somebody will snap you up. You are that sort of man. If somebody snaps me up, she must take the consequences. She must assist in the shop. And you will get the sack. Oh, you're tiresome. But you see my point at all that. No. What point? Well, that it's really cheaper to keep a wife than to pay an assistant. Let alone you don't have to live a single life. You can get rid of an assistant if she doesn't suit. You can't get rid of a wife. If people thought that way, they'd never marry. Precisely. In this life, you've got to take chances. I have taken them. And escape. Oh, you won't escape here. We don't hold the bachelors here. You can't do that at General Shop here, nor a post office. While I command both, I am in an impregnable strategic position. Well, I don't like to say it, but people are beginning to talk. Beginning? When did they ever stop? Oh, there's no use talking to you. Not the slightest. Oh, well then. Take a month's notice. A month's notice? Yes, a month's notice. A month's notice? Because I refuse to marry some ridiculous village maiden or a literate widow who I can barely hold a moment's conversation. Wives are not for conversation, that's for visitors. You've had plenty of conversation with me. Leave yourself out of this conversation, please. Oh, very well. A month's notice! Don't say that again! What a nonsense! You to complain of! You're quite well off here. I'd purposely pay you ten pounds more a year than you could get anywhere else. Why? Why do you pay me ten pounds more than you can get another assistant for? Have it only nurse! I'll go this very day. I'll go this very minute. You can keep mine on. You're selfish. You don't know when you're well off. I don't wonder your wife died. Did she die mad? As a matter of fact, she did. I'm one of those unlucky men who draw the black chances in the lottery of marriage. Uh, I didn't know. I acted indeed. I was only joking. I wouldn't have said it for the world if I'd known. Never mind. I know you didn't mean it. By the way, I made an inconsiderate remark which hurt you. I'd not tell it. I should have told you seriously that I'd pay you ten pounds more than the market rate because I value your services in the shop and I wish to offer you every inducement to stay here permanently. Ten pounds extra. Stay all my life as a single woman. Not necessarily. You can get married if you wish. Who oh, to? What to? Anyone. Anyone in the village is good enough for me, but nobody in the village is good enough for you. Is that it? Don't lose your temper. I live by luck. And if you knew how close I was to putting a couple of extra words in, you'd perhaps realize that a woman wants something more in life than a job and a salary. I'm well aware. We are all after the same thing when we are young. And what is that, pray? Trouble. Adventure. Hardship. Disappointment, doubt, misery, danger, and death. Not of me, thank you. All I want is a husband and the usual consequences. The same thing. Marriage is the village for more adventures. Oh, why don't you take a more cheerful view of life? Learn not to expect much from life. That is the secret to real cheerfulness, because I'm always getting agreeable surprises instead of desolating disappointments. Well, your second marriage may be, may be an agreeable surprise, may it? What do you mean by my second marriage? I have been married only once. I mean, I have been married only once. Well, look here, straight. Now, is there any man in this village that would be suitable to me now that I've brought used to you? My dear, men are all alike. You mean it will make no difference to me who I marry? Very little. And all women are alike too, aren't they? Damn that woman, 
she won't stop talking to me and interrupting my work. Well, I tell you, you were made for one another. It may be as plain to you as to me yet, but if it's plain to me, there must be something in it. For I'm never wrong when I see a thing quite plain. I don't think you'd ever have given up being a gentleman and bought this shop if I hadn't been here. Now that you mention it, I believe that is true. You were one of the amenities of the estate. Well, I might be one of the amenities of the estate of Holy Matrimony, mightn't I? Take care. You may find what you are trying to do easier than you think. About 5% of the human race consists of positive, masterful, inquisitive people, obsessed with some passion which they must gratify at all hazards. The rest of them have what they want because they have neither the strength or courage to resist, or because the things the man who owns wants seem trifling beside the starry heavens and the destiny of man. I'm not one of the mass for ones. I'm not worth marrying. Any woman can marry me if she took trouble enough. Well, that's just what I'm afraid of. If I let you out of my sight for a month, I might find you married to somebody else at the end of it. But I'm taking down chances. I don't set up to be masterful. I don't like selfish, uppish, domineering people any more than you do. But I must, and I will have you, and that's all about it. Well, you already have me as an employer. And you're independent of me and can leave if you're not satisfied. How can I be satisfied when I can't lay my hands on you? I work for you like a slave for a month on end, and I would have to work harder as your wife than I do now. But there come times when I want to get to hold of you in my arms, every bit of you, and when I do, I'll give you something better to think about than the starry heavens as you call them. You'll find that you have senses to gratify as well as fine things to say. Senses? You don't know what you're talking about. Look around you. Here in this shop, I have everything that can gratify the senses. Apples, onions, and acid drops, pepper and mustard, cozy comforters and hot water bottles. Through the window, I delight my eyes with the old church and marketplace, built in the days when beauty came naturally from the hands of medieval craftsmen. My ears are filled with delightful sounds, from the cooing of doves to the humming of bees to the wildest echoes of Beethoven and Emily. My nose can Gloat over a sack of fresh lavender, or special sixpenny odor of cologne, and the smell of rain on dry earth is denied me. My senses are saturated with satisfactions of all sorts. But when I am full to the neck with onions and acid drops, when I am so fed up with medieval architecture that I'd rather die than look at another cathedral, when all I desire is rest from sensation, not more of it, what use will my senses be to me when the starry heavens still seem no more? A senseless avalanche of lumps of stone and wisps of gas. If the destiny of man holds out no higher hope to him than the final extinction and annihilation of so mischievous and miserable a creature. We don't bother about all that in the village. Yes, you do. Best seller here is Old War's Almanac. And next to it comes Napoleon's Book of Fate. I very much doubt whether old Mrs. Ward would have sold the shop to me if she had not become persuaded that their judgment was fixed for. The 7th of August next. I don't believe such nonsense. What's it all got to do with you and me? You are inexperienced. You don't know. You are the dupe of thoughtless words like sensuality, sensuousness, and all the rest of the twaddle of the materialists. I'm not a materialist. I'm a poet. And I know that to be in your arms won't gratify my senses at all. As a matter of mere physical sensation, you will find the bodily contact to which you are looking forward Neither convenient nor dangerous. Don't talk like that. You mustn't let yourself think about it like that. You must always let yourself think about everything. And you must think about everything as it is, not as it is talked about. Your second hand gabble about gratifying my senses is only your virgin innocence. We shall get quite away from the world of sense. We shall light a lamp for one another in the holy of holies in the temple. The lamp will make its veil transparent. Aimless lumps of stone blundering through space will become stars singing in their scales. Our dull, purposeless, village existence will become one extraordinary purpose and nothing else. An extraordinary light and an intense love will seize us. It will last hardly longer than the lightning flash which turns the black night into infinite radiance. It will be dark again before you can clear the light out of your have seen. And forever afterwards, you will think about what you have seen and what gallant petrols invented by the wasted virgins of the darkness. Is to give ourselves this magic moment that we feel that we must and shall hold.
guy. Never could bear to be nothing more to a man than a lollipop, but you mustn't expect too much. I, I shall expect more than you have ever dreamt of giving, in spite of the boundless audacity of women. I wonder what great men would ever have been married if the female nobodies who snapped them up had known the enormity of their own consumption. I believe they intended to refine, to educate, to make real judgment of their husbands. What do you intend to make of me, I wonder? I shall be proud of you. And now I've nailed you, I won't have my own now. So do I. Don't be afraid. I know it will be all right. I can't make a fine speech about it like you, but I know it will be all right. I promise you that. Very well. Uh, go around to the rectory in proper bounds and tell the rector's wife that we got some prime art shows this morning, just one more joke. You are sure you'll feel happy about it? You know what I feel about it. Do you want to use your tone and don't ask me these questions? Oh. What number, please? Oh, an order. Yes, we have some very fine artichokes in just this morning. <laughs> they will be sent around directly. Thanks very much. Oh, oh, and there's something else. Sorry to detain you. Could I speak to the rector? Yes, it's rather particular. It's about bands. Bands. Cheer me, believe me, they knew But you were the kind who would hurt me Desert me when I needed you Yes, you, you're driving me crazy What did I do to you? 